Good evening and welcome to Hybrid by Nature, Human-Machine Interaction. I'm Almut Meyer zolic Director of the Goethe Institute Hong Kong, and I'm pleased to introduce this exciting project, starting today with the opening of our online exhibition and the start of our conference. Hybrid by Nature, Human-Machine Interaction is jointly organized by Goethe Institute Hong Kong and Seoul, on behalf of the network of the Goethe Institute in East Asia. We want to look into a transformative development that is going to change dramatically all aspects of our lives and society. For the first time in the history of mankind, machines are not simply tools, but we are getting used to interacting with them seemingly on eye level. Hi Alexa, hi Siri and let more and more existential decisions in our lives being made by artificial intelligence. Are machines, intelligent robots, becoming the better versions of ourselves? And are we humans becoming hybrid by nature? Definitely, hybridity is the new normal. Human-machine interaction shows utopian, visionary, or speculative approaches in art that explore this new convergence between humans and machines. We have invited 13 artists from Asia and from Europe, and almost all of them created new works for this exhibition. The curatorial concept for this art project and the program for this conference have been developed by Sabine Himmelsbach, director of the House of Electronic Arts in Basel, Switzerland, uh, and in collaboration with Dun Choi, curator in arts and technology based in Seoul. Based on this concept, artists were suggested by nominators, all of them highly knowledgeable in their fields. You find their names on the website, and some of the nominators are here with us today. I want to take this opportunity to warmly thank you. Today is day one of our project. We are launching the online exhibition. Please take your time to explore this exciting website designed by Korean artist Yi Wan Song. The website will be online for two months until December 12. Tonight, our curators, Sabina and Dun, are taking us on a guided tour. Uh, through the exhibition with all the artists being present and sharing about their concepts. We have grouped the artists into three thematic groups. First one, blurred boundaries, conversions of real and virtual spaces. Second group is artificial intelligence, human machine interactions. And third group will be metaverse, a collective virtual space. These are also the topics of the coming three days of our conference from Friday to Sunday, with each evening revolving around one topic. We have panel discussions and sharings with curators, scholars, and artists. A gentle reminder, please book your attendance in order to receive your Zoom link. Now, let me briefly introduce our curators, Sabine Himmelsbach and Dun Choi, who will guide us jointly through this conference tonight and the coming days. Sabine Himmelsbach has been a curator, writer, lecturer, and member of international juries in the field of media art and digital culture for about 20 years. And for about the same time, she has been active in leading positions from ZKM, Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, to the prestigious House of Electronic Arts in Basel, Switzerland, of which she is the director since 2012. Her exhibitions have become internationally acclaimed. And like most recently, the show Entangled Realities, Living with Artificial Intelligence, and last year, Real Feelings, Emotion and Technology. Dun Choi is a curator in arts and technology based in Seoul and active on international level. Currently, she is serving as art director of Hyundai Motor and as a co-curator of the fifth International Digital Art Biennial in Montreal. Since 2000, she has curated numerous international exhibitions on art and technology in many cities in Asia, Europe, America, and in virtual spaces. Exhibitions that are particularly relevant to our topic include Why Future Still Needs Us, 
AI and Humanity at Art Center NABI in Seoul. Before I leave the floor to Sabine to talk, to talk about the curatorial uh, concept, allow me a bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. All microphones of the participants are muted. Please feel free to tap your questions and remarks into the chat. We will keep an eye on them and bring them into the discussion. Some artists prefer to speak in their language, like Bat Adene Bachulun in Mongolian and Issei Yamagata in Japanese. We are providing simultaneous translation into English. Please press the button on the right side uh, um, at the bottom of your screen and choose English. Now, without further ado, I hand over the microphone to Sabine. Please, Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Almut. Well, let me start. Uh, this project has a long history. My dialogue with the Goethe Institute started already two years ago when we began discussing a project that would address the radical technological changes of our time, as Almut mentioned. I would first like to thank her and Melanie Bono very much for the great trust they have granted me in the context of this collaboration. It was wonderful to work with you and I thank you and the whole team, Ujun and all other colleagues for the initiative and the great organization of the whole project. So what, what is, it, is it about? Machine learning, algorithms and intelligence robots have found their way into our everyday lives and are increasingly determining them. Neural networks and machine learning deliver spectacular breakthroughs in facial recognition, natural language translation, and even the recognition of emotional states, which is the result of enhanced computational power and availability of big data. Highly effective algorithms are now increasingly being used in commercial transactions and our daily interactions are shaped by the so-called internet of things a growing network of interconnected devices embedded in everyday objects and enabling them to in indirectly communicate. The internet itself is undergoing a major transformation. With the blockchain, a new key technology has emerged that promises more decentralization and self-determination. The digitization of our lives was further intensified during the pandemic Many online exhibition formats emerged, or we could also say re-emerged as they art on the internet has always taken place since the 1990s. From 3D scanned rooms and exhibition tours to virtual reality environments. And the screen was often the only way to interact with friends and family. Online games have evolved to play a major role in the world's cultural production and engage all ages and so social classes. Artists use contemporary game programming technologies to create virtual and augmented reality experiences, immersive environments, interactive stories, and multimedia installations that can be played by a multitude of players online. In his online manifesto, Italian philosopher Luciano Floridi speaks of being human in an era of hyperconnectivity. The classifications online and offline no longer apply. We are on life, as he says, meaning always connected to the digital sphere as well. As the distinction between online and offline no longer works, the distinction between humans and technical systems is also becoming more and more blurred. Artists have always been concerned with social developments, and we wanted to launch a project that looks at the issue of the increasing convergence between man and machine, this new natural hybridity in which we find ourselves today. Since the pandemic made travel impossible, we quickly developed the idea of creating an online exhibition on, the, on this topic and accompanying it with a conference that would pick out individual themes and examine them more closely. As you have heard, the blurring boundaries, AI as a topic, and uh, the metaverse, this new collective virtual space. From the beginning, the idea was to realize an exhibition in close cooperation with curators on site 
and with the respective artist scenes from the regions involved. Since a research trip for myself was not possible due to the pandemic, I'm all the more grateful that the Goethe Institute invited a wonderful network of nominators to participate with suggestions of artists or specific projects. Unfortunately, not all the artists could be invited, but it was great to be able to get a first impression of the diversity of the artist scenes in the regions of the participating institutes. Therefore, I would also like uh, to thank all the nominators once again, also on my behalf. 13 artists were finally selected. The nominated artists from the regions were joined by others that were chosen by my co-curator, Dean Joy, and myself. Almost all the works I would mention it were nearly created for the context, newly created for the context of the exhibition. And I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the participating artists for being able to develop a new work within the time, tight time frame given. The artists were asked to submit a generally digital work within the framework of the context of human machine interaction. We told them that we seek utopian, visionary, or speculative approaches in art that explore this new coexistence between humans and machines and life with intelligent objects and systems. We got amazing proposals that we are discussing today, many of them with an interactive character that invites the audience to play, reflect, and become part of it. The exhibition and conference Human Machine Interaction will be a first milestone of the project Hybrid by Nature. And we hope that next year, a physical exhibition with several partners in the region of Southeast Asia and also at HEC, House of Electronic Arts, the institution that I'm directing in Basel, can take place. Before we turn to the artists and the thematic focus we have developed for the conference, I would like to turn the floor over to my co-curator, Yun Choi, with whom I have had the pleasure to, of working on this project over the past year. And I would like also to take the opportunity to thank you, Yun, for the very inspired, constructive, enjoyable collaboration. I hand over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. This is Dun Choi, co-curator of Hybrid by Nature Machine, a human machine interaction. First of all, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all the participating artists, nominators, conference participants, and everyone who has collaborated in presenting this remarkable project, including my dear co-curator Savine. Melanie, Almut, Ujung, and all the colleagues at Goethe Institute. I believe that art is vehicle that connects us across time, space, and cultural boundaries. Today, we are inviting all of you to virtual walkthrough with 13 artists from all around the globe. Despite the long wait, we still live in uncertain times with the ongoing common crisis Never before in human history have so many people been connected virtually through the internet. The unique project with artists in art and technology critically engaged this hybrid condition and the radical forms of futurity that must respond to our moment. To reflect upon the urgency of the present and to envision possible futures, the artists are challenged to bring the complexity of contemporary society and create new experiences in digital culture to broader audiences. Artists will offer an opportunity to broaden our understanding of relationship between human nature and the machine. By revisiting this triangular relationship, you are encouraged to have diverse conversations about humanity in the age of uncertainty and individual or societal transformation which will follow the global pandemic. I hope everyone can enjoy the meaningful journey together and thank you.
All right, thank you, Dune. And as mentioned before, uh, let's now start with the projects. Uh, the artists were invited to realize works on the theme human-machine interaction. Only during the preparation of the conference, we made a thematic grouping with the focus on blurred boundaries, AI, and metaverse. We start with the blurred boundaries section, and we will present introductions of the new works by the Japanese artist duo Exonemo, which is Sembo Kinsuke and Aikaiwa Ye, the German artist uh, Sebastian Schmieck, Mongolian artist Bad uh, Erden Bachelun and Korean artist uh, Yevan Song. Their works are all very different, but in one way or another, they all address the blurring boundaries and relationship of real and virtual spaces and the impact that they have on our human conditions on our lives. Exonemo invites you to change to chance encounters online in their work Distance Between Two. And on the panel tomorrow, they will also speak more about the way how information technologies have altered our sense of distance. Sebastian Schmieck has worked a lot on the topic of humans as software extensions. And in his new work, How To, How To Give Your Best Self Some Rest, he humor humorously reflects on constant self-optimization and the aesthetic of detachment, something he will also explain in more detail in tomorrow's session. But then Bachelun presents a very poetic video titled HM Home with many philosophical layers that he's also introducing in the presentation today. Yevan Song, who also has created the wonderful exhibition website for us, presents her interactive work, Walking on Website, where she literally invites us to walk on the website by taping on the keyboard. We will screen the four video presentations of the artists now and afterwards engage in a discussion with them. Please put your questions in the chat and we will take them up to debate them with the artists. So can you please have the four videos now? to give your best self some rest is a new web and video piece in which I'm exploring something that I call the aesthetic of detachment which basically could allow us to detach ourselves from performing our best selves all the time and yeah, I'm looking at our relationship with smart devices and if there is maybe a liberating moment in this relationship and I'm also yeah, looking at and wondering if face filters and I made a very cheap face filter I'm wondering if such a face filter could generate a new behavior yeah and the piece is a, is a set of video piece and it's sort of a how-to or tutorial video
Bismillah. Ah, gut, so ein Stüssen, ja, ohne Video, 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 а нэг гац мөрөө тасан та хайцгүй байгаа гэж үзвэл их бас инспирашн нэг бас харуулах гэж хичээсэн байна. Шаардлага. Walking on that website is a simple single page website where you can really walk on the keyboard. You can make walking gestures using your finger to walk on the keyboard. The background scene on the screen moves backward or forward as you walk. When virtual space meets real space, real space is open inward. Virtual space and real space are generally considered as a separate spaces. Once we enter the virtual space, all of the real space elements do not and should not exist any longer. Space seems to have the aim of forcing people to forget about the real space. It appears to cause people to fully sink into the unreal sense of space. And more immersive it is, the more it is considered to be a well-designed software. Since I generally have less power to control the virtual space, entering it is a power shift um, that makes me very uncomfortable. Instead, I am attempting to reinterpret this virtual space as an extension of real space. This means that, as a user, I can preserve the real touch interaction to follow the comprehensive real object using my finger. I can subsequently create the connection between two spaces and naturally enter the virtual space while acknowledging it is connection to a real space. Designing the virtual space is not exclusively to design the virtual space. It further includes the design of the real space as an extension of the scope. Well, thank you for the presentations. May I ask uh, June and all the other artists from the first section to uh, to show the video feed, and then we can enter into a discussion. So maybe I start with uh, with a question to. Uh, Exonemo, and please, everybody uh, who's following, uh, just uh, put your questions in the chat and we will take them up. So the relationship between uh, physical distance and emotional distance uh, through network technologies has often been a topic of your works. To what extent has the pandemic influenced the subject further? I know that you also created another work, RAM, that is very actively uh, reflecting to the pandemic as well. So maybe you can uh, elaborate on that a bit more. Hello, this is Exonimo speaking. Uh, yes. So the impact of the pandemic, even before the pandemic, in the virtual space and the network space, the relationship or the distance has been our theme. And it's being focused in on. So this is an urgent global issue. And in the past, this has changed the significance of our past works. So we have been thinking about this and we wanted to create this new work. So our works in the past. So this is not an extension, 
It's a little difficult to tell from the video, but you can take part and you can experience. So please do try to take part. And uh, because we couldn't, maybe not everybody has seen the work yet, can you explore? Because you have like the private mode and the public mode. Can you say something about that as well? Uh, yes. When you go into our work, there are two modes and you can choose. And the private mode, so there's that you can create your own URL, share it with your friends and experience with your friends. And the public mode, so you can experience together the random people who visit the website. Thank you. Uh, do you want to uh, ask a question or shall I continue? Yes, um, I know you have uh, previously uh, had commission work uh, when just pandemic started with uh, HAK. So maybe it has a kind of relationship between your previous work and this work. So if you can uh, um, kind of you know, share your context between these two works, it would be helpful for the audience to understand your current work. Yes, thank you. Yes, um, when the pandemic started, um, HEK, HEC, um, we received a commission work from them and we were in New York in lockdown back then and we had to create this work and that really coincided with the commissioned work. It's called Realm. You use your smartphone and web browser, you can um, experiment, experience uh, with these two. Uh, we looked at the distance between the two or the very uh, the relationship between the two, should I say. And our work this time and also our past work um, it, are all combined together. So I do hope that everybody can go and experience, experience it and um, see how it feels. Maybe uh, a question to Bart Elvin Bachelun before we ask some general questions. Um, your work, uh, HM Home, is very poetic and juxtaposes images of nature and man made structure. It has many philosophical layers. Um, maybe you can explain a bit more the ideas behind it and also. Um, as the, you know, during the pandemic lock, uh, lockdown, a simulated nature became part of our daily lives. Is there any further development in your practices with the new normal of the pandemic? <laughs> very good evening a very good day and good evening. good evening to all of you so the new reality uh, induced by uh, the current pandemic the, uh, the forces us uh, uh, to um, communicate uh, in a more uh, the smart ways uh, and uh, so um, which means uh, uh, even though it, it might seem real but uh, it is a plateau, a plateau, a plateau driven and it's a platform uh, confined environments uh, like you know, we're based on, based on so which means a uh, very different reality uh, the, the, the very different uh, approach. Uh, so it is, um, uh, it, it's a mixed feeling I generally have here, but this, it's advantages on one hand, at the same time, you do miss things. And maybe one more question about the work, but then uh, 
the use of sound can you elaborate maybe a bit more is it come it sounds like it comes from nature but then it's mm -hmm. also artificially altered Yes, indeed. The Dawajarat lab, I was my the sound artist, our sound sound artist is the sound author. Uh, it's a, a, the sound of water, the innate sound of water. Uh, so the sound of water brought on the surface, uh, on the dry land, so to say. The uh, what uh, what seems uh, dry it uh, it was uh, uh, water uh, previously uh, so the we are or we all come uh, from a, a liquid environment so perhaps. and uh, so these uh, uh, the the dry sound you know but we've been uh, calling it so the water uh, brought to life uh, brought to uh, the uh, dry surface. Uh, so that kind of a transition was imagined and done. Thank you. And then maybe from my side also a question to Sebastian. So your new work deals uh, with issues of self-optimization and human-like behavior of machines. And you briefly explained also in the uh, in the presentation uh, of, uh, for the work, but maybe you can delve a bit more into what you like to address with the term aesthetic of detachment. So it would kind of be a bit of a preview of what we will speak about tomorrow. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me, having me and for the invitation. Yeah, um, like in recent years, I have yeah, researched and made quite some works about the issue that often what is like proposed to be artificial intelligence turns out to be like people working and pretending or, or something like this to be artificial intelligence. And most of the time I have looked at this from like a angle of like problematizing this. But with this work, I wanted to yeah, explore a bit like a liberating moment. What does it mean when you pretend to be a smart device? Like in the short video, I was this Roomba. I was on holidays, realized, ah, shit, I need to make this video. And that's it, basically. And if we look at the way that we um, treat devices, I think, um, for example, let's say a Roomba often makes mistakes, does the same thing over and over, but we kind of have this, like, um, we still like it, think it's okay and allow these mistakes to happen. And so in the video, I'm trying to explore how, if we pretend to be these things, how this could be liberating. And I'm doing this with a set of very cheaply made face filters. And yeah, and the aesthetic of detachment is basically the term I use for this strategy to pretend that you are, let's say, a bot, a Roomba, uh, a smart log is something I use and so on. And what does it do with you? For example, I, uh, you can see it in the piece. I'm uh, pretending to be a Roomba. So I was moving around my apartment on the floor, collecting the dust with my hair and so on, just like seeing what happens. Thank you, Sebastian. Do you, do, do you want to take over or? Yes, um, I think uh, we can um, have questions to Yehuan. And um, you, first of all, most of all, I think all the artists and um, you know, the collaborators are very impressed by your tremendous work for the website. And it's a house for us. And um, your project, uh, allows us uh, the users to playful interact with the keyboard in novel and fun ways, exploring a virtual space, working with your fingers on the keyboard. Can you elaborate a bit more about why you expand the parameters of the known interface? Um, um, first of all, thank you for having me as well. Um, 
So this working on the website artwork and all the like practices that I am that I am doing as an artwork is about like changing the interaction between this virtual space and the real space because like I'm a web designer and artist I deal with the website and people think that this place is the place for the people around the world we connect each other in this web platform but actually like if we deeply look into this this platform is not that much like fair and kind of like bias it and I'm trying to like how to make this platform more like diverse for people from all different cultures and like like broaden the perspective we deal with this platform including the interaction between this uh, web um, platform and like real space and this project is one of the practice I try to like change the interaction between um, device and the platform and the virtual space by like expanding the scope of designing the virtual space so then I was really considered about like the what is the situation in the real space when user is using this website? So I'm not just designing the website inside the screen, but I was really thinking about like what's the the real um, real environment situation. So that was including that like I'm trying to like expand the spectrum of web design and the interaction between the platform because like I think this platform is for the people around the world and we need more diversity when we are designing and constructing this um, place. Thank you. And I think there will be some audiences, um, you know, who want to hear more about the uh, technological background, who, you know, I'm assuming there are like, you know, emerging artists or young artists who are like, uh, wanted to know further on this, uh, making of the website. So maybe you can share a little bit more about it uh, in uh, why you kind of want it as a transparent in terms of data and what you see in front as an interaction. Um, I think, so like it's about like the question is about the technology of this web design and development. Um, about this art, <laughs> sorry. Oh, it both, but uh, especially the, um, you know, web design aspect, you normally bring like how visualize and like, you know, the backbone of the data to be uh, more visible. Yeah. So I think that will be helpful for uh, understand when they uh, explore the uh, virtual blood boundary uh, section, yeah. So like, I think that the, including the te technology or the like method that I'm doing, like that I'm using when I'm designing the website is not that much complicated, but like it's just a shifting the perspective because like we are, we always think that website need to follow this template and website need to be very fast and user friendly so then people can just go directly and see their, see the information that they are looking for. But like actually the truth is that user is not have, having any choice and they just need to follow the what uh, this platform is already constructed. And I think like, um, so like I'm trying to like build a platform that is very much focused on the data structure. So like it directly shows the data structure in front of these websites. And that is the trial um, um, that was able, I was able to do that because I was just shifting the perspective from like this simple, like following template structure strategy to like, this can be anything, I can do anything using this uh, web technology. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure we have a Japanese comment if that is a question. Um, maybe Sambo, you could check if that is a question because I cannot read Japanese in the chat. Otherwise, maybe also a question to the whole panel. I mean, during the pandemic, uh, we had, you know, a huge push of digitization. And uh, it uh, reached, you know, lots of museums and institutions, everybody could uh, 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 put uh, on, online formats, 
uh, forward and so on? And what do you think are the benefits? And do you think that there is a, a better understanding on the impact of digital art, which was always you know, considered to be a sideline and not really integrated into the main, uh, into the main art world? I don't know who wants to take on the question. Sebastian? <laughs> Yeah, I can try to say something. Um, well, but it's also it's a bit difficult to explain, and I think we are in the in or to to answer, and I think we are in the process of finding this out with this exhibition and conference. What is what does it mean? And um, I would probably agree that um, some digital art or net art or web art has finally found some recognition which it didn't before. So that is great, and I think. Yeah, a lot of things that happen were just like scanning a 3D space and putting, you know, like the museum or the gallery online, which is most of the times not so interesting, but there is thing, very nice things happened. And I'm thinking of, for example, Constant Dullard's Common Garden platform, which is like an online platform to make exhibitions and you are a little cursor. And if you encounter another cursor, you can talk to each other and things like these. So I think... Um, yeah, quite some nice things have happened. On the other side, I think for us artists, it's often a bit yeah, frustrating that like traveling somewhere has been canceled basically, and we're just sitting at home being present somewhere else. So that is uh, hopefully will, will, will um, not always be the case. Thank you. So now we have a question. Where else can you learn these technologies if not at university? Can you recommend websites? Can these artworks be sold? Who will buy them? Um, well, also a question to, to all of you. Sebastian, you are also a teacher. Maybe you can speak from your perspective and Exonemo, maybe you can tune in as well, as you have been working in the field for such a long time. Yeah, there is, I mean, it depends a bit what you want to do, but I think a very great place, English speaking, of course, I only know, is called The Coding Train on YouTube where you can learn p5.js and it's by daniel schiffman and it's extremely funny and i think also you can learn a lot so it's a very good mixture and people often go there just they don't even need to learn something they find it so entertaining him so yeah that's i think a good place to go to maybe exonemo hi Recording ourselves, we learned by ourselves. So if we were interested, we searched on the web and you can find a lot of things So we think that's the best way to start. And will these artworks sell? Regarding this, the work that we created, we didn't think about that at all. And recently, NFT, there's some controversy about this, but there are things like that. And using this, there are some people who are selling digital art, scenes like that. So there is that potential, I think. And this time, regarding the work for this exhibition, we did not think about that. Yeah, maybe I can add uh, for myself, uh, leading an institution. Uh, directing an, an institution that is focusing on digital art that I experienced that these boundaries are also blurring that uh, a lot of institutions are now also taking on digital art but it's important to have institutions like ours like HEK for example as we bring in the historical knowledge I mean we have worked with Exonimo goes way back 20 years. I think you have been presented at the previous institution in Basel as well. And it's important that there's this knowledge and this history of art on the web that needs to be told as well. Um, there's another question. The advantage of online exhibition is convenience. Can you talk about the disadvantages?
I think can I I think personally that the convenience is can cause a disadvantage because like the large part of like exhibition is putting someone in the situation that they would not experience if they are just go like live their daily life. So like it kind of like it, it is about like putting people in com inconvenience situations so then they can like broaden their like experience by this exhibition. Um, I think that's the what exhibition functions, uh, many exhibition functions in that way. And when it comes to online exhibition for now, like there's not so many control from someone who are making this exhibition. Like for example, curators are not like fully control this virtual space, whereas they have like more control in their actual space and they can kind of curate this actual space much better than this virtual space. So like that's the part that is like a disadvantage and the limitation of this virtual space. Whereas I think still, I think that we can like um, develop ourselves further and this will get better. Oh, in the future, but for now, that can be like like uh, somehow is a disadvantage itself. Any further ads up from artists? Maybe while you're uh, thinking further, uh, I'll uh, add some more about the uh, kind of curation on the. Uh, these types of uh, new condition. Um, I would say a lot of cases um, an experiment has been more of a representation of the exhibition which is supposed to be held offline. Um, but as you experienced through our uh, exhibition, we tried our best uh, for new commissioned works to be uh, properly um, you know, participated because it is very different from the beginning, you know, it, is, it will be shown through the virtual space and um, how you can bring that uh, new space as a, your uh, territory for the interaction, then uh, it creates many of, um, you know, aspects or like new perspectives for uh, you know both artists and curators, and what could be the um, interaction with the audiences. So um, I would say, if it is not considered from the beginning, the disadvantages are you lose the actual um, meaning of the work. And uh, also it will create, uh, I would say, misunderstanding of the work. So it really has to be um, well considered from the beginning to make sure you're not uh, over interpret the work and also keep uh, interaction properly within the rim of the digital culture, because sometimes we were also considering how many projects we wanted to have in one exhibition because you often come back and forth and in order to experience all of the work, it takes quite time and um, you can easily get exhausted compared to you experience uh, the experience, uh, exhibition offline. So these uh, online exhibitions should be really carefully designed um, to get the uh, consistent uh, interest from the users because it can be easily on and off. So if you lose that um, kind of consistent interest that will just like, you know, people will only see like very bit of your work and then they will uh, interpret it in a very different way. And that's also the reason why we wanted to have this virtual walkthrough. Sometimes because of the uh, complexity of all the artists' you know, interaction, it won't be easy to uh, understand or like overview whole picture. So I hope this um, uh, you know, 
day one conference will help you at least get the glimpse of the artist's uh, work. Any comment from the artist? Uh Yes, about the advantages and disadvantages, I'd like to make a comment. So, well, maybe not advantage and disadvantage, but from 1995 to or 1996, we have been creating um, internet art. And back then, um, it was a real exhibition, and yes, we were able to control that, but if it's online, we can't really control it. And yes, you might consider that as a disadvantage, but when we started, uh, we were having these exhibitions or these happenings as an extension of people's daily lives. So maybe all, all of a sudden you might see the exhibition along the street or maybe while you're working. And we thought that that was really interesting. So we tried to create these encounters as we created our work. So that was the, about the online exhibitions that we've done in the past. Thank you so much. Um, we also have an interesting questions, how we are receiving, how one is receiving feedback on online exhibitions, but this is a more general questions, which, question which I would keep for the end discussion. And I'd rather looking at the time would ask June to uh, introduce the next uh, session grouping about AI. Great, uh, so the next session will be uh, AI and we will have uh, four artists and um, Chris Chung, uh, he uh, created the artwork called a Chronicle of Stones. And it is an AI artwork in line with the artist research of combining traditional ideology and futuristic imagination. We also have uh, another artist group, Entangled Others, Sophia Crespo and Pelican McCormick uh, with the interactive website called Beneath the Neural Waves. The artist duo based in Berlin immerses in a digital aquatic ecosystem shaped and transformed by artificial intelligence. The next artist will be Bezala Cook. Um, it's called Confidential Record Overwrite. This is a third of a computation record series following dual metropolitans and executions by her. Uh, she's based in Hong Kong and it is an imaginary world called Underground Kowloon World City where the participants are invited to walk through virtually. Uh, this is, work is not uh, you know, typically using AI technology, but uh, questioning AI governed city inspired by rare uh, Korowai's technological singularity. And the last will be Mario Klingerman and with his interactive website, Common Demorator, based on the interactive installation of the same name, and um, he invites us to change the determining parameters of an AI in real time and thus to create new demons again and again. So please welcome four artists and we will um, uh, have their presentation at first and then we will have the uh, following conversation. Please play the video. A Chronicle of Stones is an epic story with an archaeological nature with machine learning algorithm.
Stubborn Stone, appeared in the opening of Dream of the Red Chamber, one of China's four great classical novels written in Qing Dynasty, The Forgotten Flying Stone in the Myth about Nua, the mother goddess of Chinese mythology, patching the sky. The stone becomes spiritual and materializes human beings. With memory, it records all kinds of things that happen on the earth. Inspired by generative adversarial networks, GENS, a chronicle of stones emphasis the evolution of the deep learning process of ancient Chinese stones appreciation. The 3D visual representation of the stone are based on a pre-trained set of Chinese landscape ink painting which contain a traditional aesthetic of scholar stone. The newly generated stone's landscape will present the hybrid and inheritance from the past to the future. Hello, we are Sophia and Felican from Entangled Ada Studio. So today we want to share with you a new iteration of the project Beneath the New Waves, which is very dear to us. And the main questions to begin with is, how can we dream up new ecosystems? Can doing so help us understand the concept of existing always in relationship to others? So with this project, we attempt to explore biodiversity by creating digitally an aquatic ecosystem as a means of uh, attempting to engage with a very abstract concept of relationship. And these dioramas of artificial life together with the various cultural fragments, imagery and text reach out towards the complex entanglement of natural life, both with itself and others. So in this web experience, you can click and drag across a map of an artificial seafloor and explore various fragments of something that an explorer might have left there. All this data doesn't exist. It's all generated data. And the reason why we like so much working with AI to generate is that it really stimulates our imagination. So finding all these bits and pieces, you can construct in your own imagination an artificial version of this seafloor and this ecosystem and what kind of life might thrive in there. So by clicking in the orange dots, you might find a 3D render or you might find a, a segment of an audio or uh, you might find some text. So we're really looking forward to share more with you about this experience and explain you a bit more about where this project comes from. My name is Vesva Kalo. I'm an android. I'm a trader. I betrayed the third polar industry. For the past centuries, human beings' pursuit of civilization and supreme social order led to the most illustrious invention, machines. The advancement of technology became the framework of totalitarian rule. Machines determined the professions, skills, and perspectives demanded by society. Driven like a ceaseless will, the world rolled feverishly towards a utopian fantasy. Until one day, both human beings and artificial intelligence realized that humankind were no longer applicable to the perfect society they had formulated. The nature was stubborn like rank grass. The annihilation of them was not slaughter, but creation. Once they were eliminated, a more effective, more ethical and healthier society can be established. Third polar seemed to have risen overnight, with their matrix loaded with source code of the impeccable society. Artificial intelligence began to arrest and imprison human beings on a large scale, and then carried out ideological transformation and genetic rewriting on them in batches. For those who are unchangeable, like androids with bad code, they need to be eliminated immediately. Civilization is sterilization. The power of that polar surpasses any previous human civilization immeasurably, which means that its domination over individuals is also tremendously greater than before. All the existing combat systems and defense mechanisms of mankind have become extremely exposed and tenuous. 
The number decreased briskly within a few years. Those who were considered to meet basic criteria for living were transferred to limited living spaces. Outside were forbidden zones. There had never been such a clear city boundary. Third polar seemed to be approaching utopia in the matrix. However, incidents like attacks on artificial intelligence and the system became frequent. Large-scale investigations and inspections had also been fruitless. The source code in the matrix was provoked by a ghost. Then I arrived at underground Kowloon Ward City. Mario will oh, share. Oh, I'm on. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was me already. I'm starting to share my screen. So. Um, let's, And sorry, uh, can you hear me? I hope so. So I'm showing you now a common demoniator, my contribution in real time, which is a alchemic lab a petri dish, which allows you to explore uh, the latent space of StyleGAN, which is a public latent space that everybody should know by now that allows you to create these faces uh, that look human or not together. So that's the interesting part here that everybody who enters this room shares the same interface. And uh, I think it might even become almost like a, a little touring test where you're not sure if something you see moving on the screen is some other person or if it's just a machine kind of adjusting. Uh, so I see this almost like an educational tool because that's like it allows you to get a feel for the entanglement of these latent spaces, because these are at the core of what we call AI now. And uh, they, well, they are a bit like alchemy because we can only experiment with them to experience them. And uh, so you have this now, this puppet that you can control, but each string that you pull kind of does not exactly control, uh, well, a single end, a single property of that face. So uh, I hope it is kind of allowing us like everybody to get more of a feeling how these spaces are complex, but also maybe like learning an instrument, we over time learn the language of, of these new spaces. So I think that's it for me. Thank you. Great. So we can share. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please share through the chat. And we have all artists uh, joining us today. And Chris, I own. Can you can you open your video? Great. Great. Sabine will join soon. She's here, but uh, somehow camera is not working. But um, so we will start uh, actually the questions to Chris. And um, by the way, thank you for all your great presentation, especially for the live session with Mario. And um, the specifications to the artist will follow either uh, me and uh, Sabine together. So um, Chris, first of all, uh, your work refers to the old Chinese tradition, the artistic appreciation of the stones and align it with the current technological development, machine learning processes. These hybrid stones are in between past and the future and between the real and artificial. Also the physical and digital sphere collide in your transferring an installation into the digital room. Can you share your thoughts on creativity in the age of AI and the role of artists? Yes, uh, thank you, Duan. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris, um, Chris Chang. Um, I'm an artist based in Hong Kong. First of all, I would like to thank um, Gothic Institute um, and also the jewelry panel to select my works. And this is my pleasure to share um, my latest installation and uh, 
a series of uh, uh, AI-based uh, artworks in, in this exhibition. So um, for your questions, um, I think uh, it's very interesting because um, for me using AI technology in this uh, recent years, uh, I found that there are some uh, different interesting things. Uh, first of all, I would like to show one thing in, on my table. Uh, I'm not sure if this is already showing. Can I, can I show it? So uh, this is a traditional, uh, <clears throat> let me take it more carefully because it's quite expensive. <laughs> So this is a traditional scholar stone uh, on my hand. And um, I want to spot out that uh, actually um, almost over a thousand years uh, time or maybe uh, 2000 years time, uh, the appreciation of scholar stone haven't changed in, in ancient Chinese. So um, I found out that uh, I really want to use a new perspective to uh, take the traditional art into a new uh, new method. So that's why in my project, A Chronicle of Stones, I tried to explore a new way to present uh, this kind of um, new, new aesthetic of stones. So um, in the uh, video, uh, just uh, introduction videos, you will see that there are a few uh, scholar stones. Those are real stones. And then I use a uh, method to do the photogrammetry and then to do the 3D scanning the whole stone uh, with a digital archive in in the in the data set. So um, this is a very uh, uh, new way because in the past there's a traditional way you can't really archive a stone. Uh, for what uh, the people can do in the past, they do the um, stone rubbing. So this is a way that they use a paper and then put on the Put, put on to the uh, surface of the stone and then use a ink pen or kind of a uh, pen to sketch it. So this is a way they, they can archive a stone. So in my project, I'm trying to use uh, a new way to scan the stone first. And then after that, um, I use the AI to learn uh, a thousand years of uh, Chinese landscape painting and try to map, map back on the surface of a stone. So, um, the traditional way of appreciating a stone, scholar song is actually very um, important um, aspect or maybe uh, a treasure of the, um, a scholar in a, in, a, in, a, in a traditional way. So they see a scholar song and then they, from the scholar song, they inspire them to create an ink landscape painting. So I try to reverse the process and try to use the AI technology to learn from the past and then recreate a new way of uh, appreciation song. So, so this is, the ambition I'm trying to uh, uh, present a new way of appreciation. And also I wrote, I, um, during the, uh, my research on uh, AI, I also create a series of calligraphy, paint, uh, calligraphy uh, uh, projection in my previous uh, artworks. And what fascinated me about AI is not something that we use in AI to create something new. But uh, if we take into the data and then we see the machine, how they are trying to learn, uh, it's actually the, 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 the gang's learning method is very close to a neural network uh, thinking. So um, uh, this is what I observed that um, in my recent years um, artworks, I'm trying to present a aspect of disappearing. And I also want to present the beauty of uh, loss in translation. That's because of AIs keep learning and then they create new language. And then actually uh, uh, you, will, you will lose um, some of the perspective in appreciation. So this is uh, some of my research on this project. Yes. Thank you. And um, any further question from Sabine? If not, we can uh, move on to the next artist. Yeah, we, we already have a question to uh, Mario actually from the audience. Uh, I read it. I'd like to ask you about the face generation demo. Is it online in real time or is it a special way of blending the already pre generated images? I think it looks great, very formal, and I'd like to know more about it. No, so it's actually generated in real time on a GPU machine that's running in the cloud right now. So 
all the kind of mouse commands are getting sent via socket to a server and that creates the feature vector and then it generates a new version of the image which well i i like also my technical challenges so it was kind of tricky to get that happening but yes so everything is actually generated by a style gan model that is running right now so and thank you very much for for liking it <laughs> so and i mean i i have not tested it yet with like 100 people using it at the same time so in the end but in the end it's always just it's almost like a video stream but it's that video stream is generated kind of by one model so ideally it should never die <laughs> i hope that answered the question I have uh, more general questions, but maybe before we uh, get into the discussion with all of you, uh, 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 Chris and Mario, you both actually work with guns and uh, use artificial technology. Gisela, you are reflecting on the impact of uh, artificial intelligence on society. And then, of course, also the socio-political and ethical issues that need to be ta tackled. Uh, can you explain a bit the strategies behind uh, this in relation to the erasure of memory, which is also an issue in your work? Yeah, thank you for your question. And then, first of all, as usual, thank you uh, for like inviting me to be part of the uh, exhibition and also uh, the panel today. And then thank you especially to Yehuan to make the uh, website happen. And I. Uh, and I really think your video presentation is so cute. It gives the finger a really proper exit. So uh, yeah, getting into your question. Uh, my way of working is uh, basically research-based. I research into books and history, uh, events and facts, and then how, and to see how those uh, history could impact on our daily life. And then, uh, uh, yeah, recent, recent, my research is more into the, uh, how to say, the byproduct and outcast of modernity. So uh, for the work I'm presenting, I actually read a lot about like uh, uh, modernity and then maybe the Holocaust and, and uh, yeah, towards that direction. So uh, this, uh, between the uh, technology and the so-called erasure of memory, this actually a plot in the uh, media walk. So it has, uh, I'm not like uh, gonna be like uh, uh, explore too much about the work, but just to say yeah, it has two layers. Uh, so imagine like uh, in the future, we have uh, so much advanced technology that can uh, cyberization uh, our body, the organs of uh, of our body, how much do we change our body until we cannot call ourselves human anymore? And in that term, our body will become more and more like a container. If you want more capacity or other functions, just configure as it needed. And if it broken, get it fixed. It can be only like better than before. So in that term, what makes human human? And in an era where the container can be configured what can define the uniqueness of an individual. So yeah, that's one layer. Another layer is uh, has to do with the so-called reformation. It's actually a concept that comes with um, modernity. So in specifically this work, this story, uh, this AI region called Third Polar is actually a metaphor. It, rep it, pre present it represents all the totalitarian authorities. So in the work, there is a way to I designed, so well, I said there's a way that to modify one's ideology through a physical operation. Like quickly you get like this person's uh, mind reversed. And then with our brain cyberized, the process of reformation to avoid opponents will be much easier. So yeah, this is basically uh, the eraser of memory that has to do with the settings of my work, yeah. Yes. Anyone? We, 
yeah. So actually, some of the uh, you know audience might not know about the uh, actual city you kind of referred and what was the social context uh, behind that city to be part of your project to make a very interesting and relevant uh, project. Okay, I'll quickly uh, uh, explain a little bit. So uh, this is, uh, there is like already a uh, uh, demolished like, so called complex called Kowloon Walled City in Hong Kong. So it was like built in Song Dynasty almost, almost like 1000 years ago. And then all through this year, the, the purpose of the city and the density of this population, it changes. And then in the uh, very end of last century, uh, 1995 or something, it was finally demolished um, and then it became Uh, so actually, a, a appear the image of it appear in a lot of like video games and uh, and movies like like uh, uh, ghost 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 in a shell and then uh, uh, cyberpunk. Yeah, if you just uh, like Google it. So the image of it is an overloaded like cultural icon and always found uh, with this like so advanced technology and and future like dystopia situations. Uh, although it's kind of like uh, uh, a complex of very poor people back then. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, historical background. So it's my work like at the beginning is to bound this, uh, the whole uh, st story uh, with this uh, 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 law of um, the law of uh, uh, the law of acceleration return by uh, Rick Cruzwell, he stated that um, our technology is actually going exponentially instead of like linearly, we are right before the explosion. Uh, the time point he uh, predicted was like 2045 that artificial intelligence will be as smart as human. So yeah, basically at the first stage is the combination of this two things and then the following step just like it grows with the uh, social issues we're facing and uh, the political problems in in the world and then to involve more like general like history issues yeah thank you i'm sure um there are more questions coming up but uh, i would like to move on to um entangled others um sabine is like go uh, yeah, so um, you take us to this imaginary aquatic space that has been, uh, you know, uh, created by artificial intelligence. So are there, what are the utopian aspects that you address with it kind of also in a post, post anthropocentric world or is there a utopia in it or not? Gosh, I, I hope it's not utopian in the sense that um... It's trying to, so what we've been trying to do with this work and this sort of series of meditations that has been beneath the neural waves is to explore, you know, how do we represent and how do, can we have an interface with uh, ecosystems that are, you know, entirely beyond our reach, but at the same time, we are critically dependent upon. And a lot of the problems we, and the interesting aspect of using, you know, um, AI with this or machine learning with this is, we have to use the data that you know, is actually available for this. And what we find very quickly is there's very little data about the natural world that is in any way comprehensible, you know, especially about the depths of the ocean, which are you know, quite still quite unexplored. And as such, you know, what we, what we can, the, the amount of material available to train various models upon is really quite small. So you have quite a sort of um, a lack of diversity or conversely by using models that have been trained, you know, for example, on more standard uh, data sets like ImageNet and so on, you have more of a representation of the mundane and the knowledge of the mundane space of uh, our world or our worldview as we have it. And these sort of together become kind of like um, a rather interesting way of exploring what is present in our, um, or available to us 
today with you know the natural world and how can that also sort of start to make the the limits uh, of this visible to us in some way or tangible in some way you know because there are countless forms of jellyfish out there for example but we when we encounter jellyfish online or if we try and create even a data set of them you know we'll have very little variety as such compared to the variety out there and the variety yet to be even discovered so we're constantly sort of like in that sort of edge of what we know and sort of trying to bridge out to the unknown and I think like the sort of it's not really utopian I think but it's more of an attempt at trying to explore different ways of, of thinking about how can we create empathy or empathic interfaces towards these very you know hard to empathize with kind of ecosystems and creatures out there so that's really the sort of focus we have with this series is trying to sort of see how can we sort of try and stretch the, the limits of our knowledge and try and like, see is there any way of creating stepping stones out towards another because i don't think it's utopian to consider a worldview where we aren't as in the center as we are per now and the sort of hopefully more sustainable consequences of adopting that kind of worldview. But at the same time, we do suffer somewhat, you know, from a crisis of imagination. It's very hard to imagine that world. And the only way we have to really try and work with that is to try and explore how can we, you know, stretch those limits or visualize what we have now and then where do we go from there? You know, it's more of a experimental sketch-like process into that. Um, I hope that, that answers something. Yeah, it's interesting kind of envisioning the future by looking into the past, as you mentioned, with the existing data sets. Um, I think we don't have much time, but uh, maybe one general question to all of you. What is creativity in the age of AI? You know, who wants to take Maybe Mario? You've been working from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. also maybe everyone has different definition of actually artificial intelligence. So we can start from there. And then what is the creativity in the artificial intelligence? OK, so I think my, my very short take is uh, creativity in the age of AI is asking, knowing to ask the right questions. Or if you don't know to ask the right questions, then use the AI to stumble a call, make interesting accidents happen that then raise new questions in you. And so, yeah, I think in the end, AI is a tool like, like other tools that came before, but uh, unlike previous tools, it's not bound to the physical sphere. So if I drop an ink drop on a piece of paper, it can also give me ideas about shapes or where to take it to. But now we have this tool which, yes, can harvest the knowledge of people that came before us, the world of images, art, anything, and uh, make meaningful accidents happen. So, and it is still then us who have to recognize what's uh, interesting or something that is becomes ours and we can transform it into something even more relevant. And Chris, would you like to add something as well, kind of from your uh, perspective, bringing together tradition and innovation? Yeah, like what uh, Mario said, I think the most interesting thing, um, yeah, and I am uh, very fascinated by the uh, some some kind of accident that's when the machine learning process goes on and it keeps on creating something um, very, a uh, surprising uh, a result for me. And this is the way that uh, it will generate a new perspective and also a new way of uh, uh, pushing boundaries or maybe um, uh, creating a new way to uh, look into the traditional art. So uh, that's quite interesting for me to, to using this method to, uh, to, to create uh, the dialogues here. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And uh, and we have a question from the audience to Rosella. Uh, can you say a bit more in what way the underground wall city is questioning or debunking imaginaries such as Kurzweil's singularity fantasy? Sorry, uh, for me, it's, it's more like a situation. 
the the uh, column will the, the underground column was uh, the underground city. Sorry, it's more like a situation rather than uh, rather than questioning. So, uh, like I said, more recent research is um, talks about the modernity and byproduct in outcast. So. Uh, there's a uh, there's a saying that um, I'm recently looking into is that the uh, the concept of waste waste product waste humans and those like unwanted people that came with actually uh, the industry era so before like in ag agriculture uh, systems we don't actually have the concept of waste and like everyone can be recycled everything can be recycled and to bring new lives so if we have this concept then we need to like define what is waste and what is good. So it's like a binary uh, binary definition of like everything in society. So like all those all those that so-called the the uh, uh, perfect society doesn't need it goes to kind of like far away distance like waste dump site far away from the city center far away from everyone. So uh, yeah, it's more like a, like a representation of this kind of situation. We see it now and probably uh, with the technology uh, accentuated, probably this problem will be like more severe. And uh, yeah, we kind of like, yeah, have this situation because of oppression, hatred, plundering. And yeah, maybe because in the matrix, weeds and pests should be exterminated. So, yeah, I hope that kind of like explain the question. Thank you. Maybe we have one more question for actually uh, the Venice, the neural waves. It is during the design phase, did you ever consider making those map explanation point more random? I think um, it connects to the question about the creativity. Yeah, um, they are somewhat random to begin with, but as this was, you know, for this uh, for this exhibition, we wanted to try something new we hadn't done before. So this way of working with the uh, such this kind of interface was the very first time, and with the time constraints we had, we weren't able to push up further. But of course, in future iterations, we would like to see this, you know, go further further in depth also instead of like the topography of this uh, gener this generative topography that one has available. Great, since uh, we are expecting one more session with the uh, less of the artists, let's keep other questions for the end of the uh, whole presentation. So thank you for everybody for this session. And then I will pass over my mic to Sabine for introduction of the next session. Thank you, Dune. So the last part uh, is metaverse, a term that is currently very fashionable. It refers to the further development of the internet into a space in which all virtual worlds merge into a single collective space. The internet has undergone a major transformation in recent decades. If in the 1990s, uh, one still spoke, spoke of Web 1.0, in which the transfer of the analog world into the virtual world was accomplished, so the so-called Web 2.0 brought with it the great unification through social networks such as Facebook, Instagram, Vibo or WeChat. In addition, addition to global networking, however, it is primarily the data of users that is scanned and filtered by algorithms and monetized accordingly. With the blockchain, a new key technology has emerged that promises decentralization and transparency. These, de these developments from online game worlds to blockchain environments are the focus on, of this section. We will present the Korean artist group Loop and Tail with their project uh, Garden of Rules, a simulation game using the interaction between humans and artificial intelligence agents. Uh, Loop and Tail will also speak about their artistic practice on day four of the conference. London-based Chinese artist Winnie Shi presents her work 
funeral play, also a simulation game powered by blockchain technology on the topic of our digital afterlife. She will also join us for the metaverse section on Sunday with more info on the crypto space from a player and researcher perspective. The German Austrian artist Du Übermorgen has submitted the work 177, a website that reflects on utopian spaces of potentiality in a post anthropocentric world. Japanese artist Issei Yamagata has realized the new browser uh, based net film blank screen that offers a personal and non shared experience. And Danish artist Stina De Dea will explain the concept and ideas behind her new video, Dawn Forest and the Advance of a New Human Machine Like Species. Unfortunately, Dina, Stina cannot join us for the conversation. She uh, is ill, but uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion with the artist. And now let's see the presentations. Thank you. Funeral Play is a fictitious concept project. We invite the audience to attend a simulated funeral for their lost loved ones. Funeral Play aims to provide a post-mortem digital domain for all values. A done by gangsters midnight hideout. A professor's dreary mahjong room. A group of fangirls party. A feng shui master's orchard. A cat meme lover's gallery. An otaku's retreat. These scenarios are not typically or traditionally appreciated in mainstream funeral culture, but if there is to be any sense of freedom or recognition for the people who do like these cultures, then it would be after death outside of the restrictions of life. 
as this is going on, the mourners can choose to delete the electronic footprints of the deceased on the deceased's behalf. Or they can upload them as an electronic heritage in the online memorial. The website speculates on a future in which NFTs have already become the new model of reality and every single conceivable item now has an NFT version. In the setting of the online funeral, NFTs are given as memorial gifts to be sent to one of these virtual mausoleums. This is facilitated by blockchain technology, as mourners are able to purchase NFTs as tokens of remembrance for the deceased and permanently display them in the digital heaven. Through interaction with the scene, the mourners find hidden clues and uncover them, obtaining prizes and enabling more gifts. The more time they spend in the space, the more rewards they can achieve. Disclaimer. Funeral Play does not share data with other platforms and does not have any actual financial function. Hugo Morgan's project named 177 is a reflection on utopian evolution using rudimentary technology, bad design and super basic interaction. The user enters a number from zero today to 177,000 years in the future or past or some other concept of time and space, creating a terrain, sort of a cut through the sediments where each layer represents a speculative possible impossibility. The layers or sediments are machinistic flora and fauna, geometric organisms, hallucinatory speciesism, networked organisms, a non-anthropocentric sediment, whatever that could mean from our perspective, non-endemic alien fusion, highly vulnerable back-end, which means bacterial intelligence, Non-binary transpollination, the impossible possibility sediment, physics and compression, and last but not least, homo fusers, hope punk synesthesia. Now, this may not mean too much for anybody, or for us, or at all, but in combination with the primitive terrain, the overlay interaction with text, and the Disney sounds that echo from the present into the spheres back into our current perception may trigger hallucinations of possible futures and parallel realities. We cannot know and we should not know what happens and what happened and what might happen, but the power of our imagination, the power of language can constitute something like a reality and we want you to participate and be able to experience some of the feelings we have towards post-evolutionary and post-anthropocentric concepts of existence. Enjoy, and thank you for freaking out or not freaking out. Regarding this work, I'd like to say a few words. And the spectators will access and can move the story forward. And this website, so none of the actions are saved and there's no communication. You can visit only once. And the appreciator will enter text and upload the images and can enjoy the work. And our lives today cannot be cut off from the internet or the screen, and what we see and feel. On the other side of the screen, there's the big other, and it's become natural to show this to the big other. So what we create, what we express, and we ourselves are shared with others. That's the basic premise. And facing the screen is bleaching yourself, whitening yourself, turning yourself into a commodity, and adding value. So this is taking part in the cycle of giving to others.
And the photo photographer, Volgan Gilman, says, your body is yours. And this goes without saying, but in reality, your body is yours. And when you hear that, you wonder, is that really true? So your screen is yours. So your screen is actually no longer your own. And as a work, that's what I had in mind when I created my work. That's all. Hi, my name is Dina. I'm a Danish artist uh, currently living and working in Copenhagen. And um, I was really happy to make this new piece of work uh, for this exhibition. And it's called Dawn Chorus. It's a video piece. And the title refers to when birds sing at the start of a new day. And I kind of see this video piece somehow as the third and last part of a trilogy with thoughts on cryopreservation. Um, this is something I worked a lot with over the past few years and I've been researching a lot. Um, and cryopreservation is basically when you freeze uh, people after their clinically declared death and you, you freeze them at a uh, minus 196 degrees and then you're kind of waiting for technology to catch up so you can come back to life um, and in this video they are actually coming back to life and they're coming back as kind of a new species and um, in the video you see them kind of defrosting and then they basically all have their own voice. The idea kind of came to me two years ago when I had a child myself um, and I was walking around with the stroller all the time and uh, there you just think really well when you walk and um, the, the I was thinking about the stroller as almost kind of a prosthetic for the child like a way of exploring the world um, and yeah it kind of opens up the world for you then i kind of started seeing this pushchair as something that just represent this uh, exploration but also like extreme youth and kind of an important tool in in a, in a phase of like deep learning and adaptations in humans Basically, you see eight of these uh, individuals uh, or entities in the video, and they all have their own voice. So they all together kind of form a new choir. Yeah, so they're all singing in a new day. And um, I'm super excited to be part of this online show. And at the same time, I'm also developing um, this show as a, as a physical show and that will open a week after um yeah so thanks so much for listening have a really nice day so i would like uh, to invite june and the artists from the metaverse section to uh enable the video uh, the video function and start the discussion Great, hello everyone. <laughs> maybe I uh, we're a bit pressed this time, but uh, maybe we we'll run uh, if it's okay for everybody. Give it an extra ten minutes, and I would like to start with a question to uh, Uinishi, who addresses a very important topic, kind of like our digital afterlife. What happens with our data? And I'm always quite shocked uh, seeing, uh, for example, uh, reminders for birthdays of people on Facebook who, uh, who have died already and nobody is deleting those, uh, uh, those data sets. And uh, yeah, you, uh, you created uh, this uh, playful game, which is talking about uh, commemoration and also how in a blockchain environment. So maybe you can say us a bit more about your work uh can you hear me yeah. yeah all right so yeah firstly i would like to say 
Thank you for having me. And it's my pleasure to be part of this exhibition. Uh, so this project, um, firstly, is a non-profit project. And so the idea is, um, so now everyone is talking about metaverse, Web3, um, and this kind of topic. So um, my understanding is uh, metaverse is a framework for an extreme uh, connected life. So if you try to imagine it in the Web2 setting, you would probably end up with centralized institutions um, like Facebook or Google. And they actually own the reality and we trap in their data centers, which can be shut off at their room and they gather comprehensive data on our lives in order to sell for their profits. So, um, so with Web3, um, there's a possibility that we will have a better future. So if applied properly, it could allow end consumers to take back the ownership of our, our own data. And instead of handling over um, every detail of our lives, to the big tech company, the public will be um, able to control our own data thanks for the uh, new decentralized technology. So previously we have much networking, which probably presents the first real opportunity um, for political and digital revolution since the invention of the internet. And now we have blockchain. So I'm quite excited to see what will happen. Um, even we are still in the very early stage, but, um, and also many experts predict that it takes uh, probably at least 10 years before it reached at a point. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely excited about this revolution, but instead of taking the top-down review of um, infrastructures, I'm more interested in uh, what comes from the bottom up, like, um, the individual and their feeling and the feeling of user and um, this who are not, uh, this who um, are not to not ready to be a user. So how can new forms of care um, to be developed and embodied? Um, so yeah, that's what I'm trying to bring to my work. I think a lot of work uh, in this uh, session is talking about who control what and um, how transparency can uh, raise by the practice of artists. I think uh, the next question goes to Lupentel. Um, your game world invites us to reflect on communication and control. and. Of course, our near future may be continuously shaped through technologies, but human imagination must guide the technology rather than be controlled by technology. Can you explain the process of building your game scenario to challenge that transparency through decentralization? Um, sure. Um... First, to explain with the gameplay video, because you cannot really see the text below. <laughs> so in Gardener Rules, uh, we are trying to maintain the artificial garden in the commercial building during the lockdown, uh, even though we cannot be physically present. Um, so we rely on the machine to identify the plant's needs and move them accordingly. The, um, Interface for human machine interaction is visible with texts and buttons on the screen, but we don't know exactly how the machine understands and move the plant. So um, it's like the service platforms using AI that is like a you know black box. So we not, we want to talk about um, we want to think about the role of humans in the human machine nature relationship that is sometimes visible, but also other times invisible. Um, so, and we cannot yet communicate directly with plants, um, you know, but through my experience growing them, because we have lots of plants in our studio, 
they they be, they've supported us emotionally for for like two years now you know <laughs> and um so from my experience i find that my consistent gaze is very important i don't know their exact state but as i watch them sometimes i see their expression is different from yesterday <laughs> like facial expression like seriously <laughs> i can see that sometimes <laughs> so uh, interacting with someone who has a different communication system and trying to understand them is a critical part to co coexist and we think machine can help with this effort. So we want to demonstrate how machines deliver the plants to the place uh, where they can breathe deeper when we look. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. you Thank you very much. And uh, I think from Ubermark and your project is also about this uh, coexistence and layers in a, in a universal structure and potential future in a way what we had discussed before in the AI section, this latent space of possibilities and how can we envision a future with the tools we have at hand. So my question to you, uh, Hans, is how can you describe a bit more how you see the future interplay of human machine interactions? Yeah, thanks. Super cool to be here. Um, I like the face of the plants that you can actually read. I'm much too insensitive to that. Um, yeah, actually, coexistence is really an important, has become a really important word. Also, uh, in the research we are being doing, in terms of hope punk, I don't know if you if you heard this term already. Uh, it's an open term. Uh, it's about radical vulnerability uh, in order to 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 as a form of resistance. So we're we're currently writing a manifesto on this. This is very much intertwined with what we have been doing, and mainly also thinking uh, 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 in terms of what you mentioned, like possible impossibilities and impossible possibilities. Um, uh, in order to construct the idea of what future scenarios are, not what they will be or how they will be, but what they are now. Yeah, so it's a kind of a compound at play. Uh, uh, and it's already at play for a long time. I call it the networked organisms or networked ad hoc networked organisms. They're like complex organic silicon based organisms that are like multifold, they can be small or global. Uh, 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 so-called individuals can be part of, 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 of many such organisms at the same time or, or asynchronously. Um, <clears throat> but I think the, the challenges uh, of being the process of sensory input at a much higher level, we are completely overwhelmed with sensory input. Uh, and that has been uh, uh, a problem in, in the evolutionary process at the at the moment right now humans are are not adapting fast enough we are fucking things up because we're not adapting we're not capable of adapting and that's why i i believe or why my take is that we are within this networked organism we are kind of understanding now that we are part of networked organisms always have been um what that what that actually means i i really don't know this is also part of the work it shows in a very kind of visually fucked up and simplistic way uh, 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 that, that we are just living in the now and we have literally no idea what will come because it's right now, uh, but we can, create, uh, we can create kind of utopian imaginations of the now or, or possible nows and possible constructions of, of, of uh, and that I would call, if you want, the metaverse or, 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 or something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Hans. Maybe do you have the last question to Issa Yamagata and then I think we need to wrap it up. Yes, um, it is about, um, you know, the what is the personal and what is public because your work uh, definitely is on the net, but it's very personal and intimate interaction. Can you tell us more about personalized experience to expand our activities in virtual space by combining notion 
of the reality in the age of metaverse. Hi, uh, yes, thank you. First, the metaverse, when you think about the concept before that, you recall what happened before, cyberspace or virtual reality or post-internet. So there are a lot of such words. And in principle, these kinds of concepts were very similar, but virtual became mixed in. And then it was like sounding the alarm bell and it sounded like it was getting more exciting, but then it kind of disappears. So in principle, when you think about it, you tend to get misled, I think. Therefore, it's difficult to say, but if you had to say, the internet can be virtual, but it is for now and it's following now, therefore, the live distribution or the SNS ups. So the closer they are, that information has more value and the works too. This is real time. If you say it's real time, it looks like it has value. So it's like a fresh food. So the fresher it is, the better it is. So I feel that by giving up, by giving people your now, you know, this kind of thing has been concerning me, but you, which is personal, so valuing that and looking back, the past, looking at the past, that's something that's very important. Thank you. I think we have question for uh, Luini Shi uh, about your uh, work. And um, the concept of this work is interesting and lived in as if there is a unique worldview behind it. And I would like to know how the inspiration was uh, generated to be determined. Just unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. So, um, uh, so the project, um, you could find it use a text startup commercial style in web in website storytelling. But the reason behind it is I, I found this kind of like white paper style has become a narrative genre. So I would like to try to use its aesthetics to present our concept. Uh, but the con project itself doesn't have any actual financial function. And again, it's not a commercial project. Um, and the project uses gamification principles we're already familiar with. And the game mechanism um, is simple. It's a play to earn game. So it uh, means you're earning tokens through gaming and use a token, you can exchange NFT decorations. And so at the moment, the project is just prototype level um, presentation. And it's a concept project and probably just gonna stay as a concept project because I'm an animator and to run in such thing is just more than what I can handle. And what else I want to say? Um, so yes, it was inspired by my some of my friends' idea, but um, I would suggest the audience to decode um, by themselves instead of telling you uh, the stories of those rooms. And, um, and so the initial idea was the funeral website was uh, will be a scene of my next film. I thought, so I thought, why not just build up a real website? So yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. There's one more question for you, Rini. Uh, which chain are the NFTs based on? Um, you mean on this website? I guess so, yes. Uh, it's all fiction. So it's no like is a rim or SOL or anything. It just you can understand it as like this private chain, public chain. They're all running at this thing, but it's all fictional. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And we are already over time, so uh, I think we need to to wrap it up. I would like to thank everybody, uh, the artists, for uh, participating, and I would want to stress that you have not seen the actual work. You have seen introductions to the works and I really invite everybody uh, to go see the website, explore the works, uh, spend more time with them. 
I, I promised at the beginning that we would have this last question that was uh, given in the after the first session, how receiving feedback on online exhibitions. So maybe that's a question to everybody who has been part of the panels. I don't know who wants to take it on. A lot of you have been working online for a very long time. And I don't know if there's any comments beyond uh, Google Analytics. <laughs> Can every, everyone share your like uh, great feedback from your previous uh, practices online? That was the question uh, from the first session. It's not only for the uh, for, like five artists we are having here, but any artist who participated earlier can take over the mic and video and share your thoughts. Anyone? I mean, about the online exhibition feedbacks, I, I actually, I don't appreciate feedback because I'm too sensitive. It, 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 it fucks me up, I don't want to know. But um, actually we get more feedback about for online exhibitions than in, in, in real life, because usually we're not there. So we feel nothing. At least online, there is kind of a reference or on Twitter, you can or, or you can send us emails and we can talk like that. Or the next time someone sees you, you you uh, you talk about it, you know, that's that's. But actually, I'm happy without feedback. <laughs> Any other artist who just bumped up? <laughs> I see Mario came up, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not sure if I should say anything because like we are so close together. But okay, so I definitely miss real conferences with the real human feedback. So, I mean, I have the comparison. I mean, this was great, but there's definitely something that like a, a beer at the bar or just a personal conversation on the, on the outside cannot, uh, cannot be replaced somehow. So it's there is also the atmosphere so it's great that we have this mesh these means to to get together in times like these but uh, i i still waiting for the perfect replacement for for human contact <laughs> so in that sense as somebody who pushes ai i i still want to maintain kind of human touch I think that is a very uh, nice last uh, quote from one of our artists. And I would now hand over to Almut Meyer-Zolic yeah. for closing the mark. Thank Absolutely. you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, maybe tomorrow we can all bring our glass of beer or glass of wine. So at least we have then can cheer together. So thank you very much uh, for, for all of you, to all of you for joining us tonight. It was really wonderful to uh, sort of immerse ourselves into these great artworks. I'm so happy with it. I must say, it, after so many months of um, yeah reflecting and and uh, working together on that, I'm I'm uh, incredibly happy uh, that we have all your works on this beautiful web website now. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next three days. Uh, so. Um, to, uh, to the audience, I would like to say, please uh, come back tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we will have, um, um, uh, the topic will be blurred boundaries and we will have Exonemo, Sebastian Schmieck, Yukiko Shikata and Ansisi Worms facilitated by curator and researcher Bi Shin. So I hope to see you all again and I wish you a lovely rest of the evening with a glass of wine or a glass of beer or a herbal tea. Why not? Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.